Lord Jesus Christ, who before ascending into heaven, did promise to send the Holy Spirit to finish thy work in the souls of thy apostles and disciples, deign to grant the same Holy Spirit to me, that he may perfect in my soul the work of thy grace and thy love. Grant me the spirit of wisdom, that I may despise the perishable things of this world and aspire only after the things that are eternal, the spirit of understanding, to enlighten my mind with the light of thy divine truth, the spirit of counsel, that I may ever choose the surest way of pleasing God and gaining heaven, the spirit of fortitude, that I may ever bear my cross with thee, and that I may overcome with courage all the obstacles that oppose my salvation, the spirit of knowledge, that I may know God and know myself, and grow perfect in the science of the saints, the spirit of piety, that I may find the service of God sweet and amiable, the spirit of fear, that I may be filled with a loving reverence towards God and may dread in any way to displease Him. Mark me, dear Lord, with the sign of Thy true disciples, and animate me in all things with Thy Spirit. Amen. Hello and welcome to the very first lecture on Genesis and uh, today we will be starting with Genesis chapter 1. Uh, so far you have been doing the Gospel of Luke and uh, everything that it included like miracles, parables etc. But now we will be starting with um, the book of Genesis that is the very first book in the Bible. So it shouldn't be that difficult to open. Uh, just kidding. Um, a few instructions before we start. Um, I know that you guys have done Genesis um, especially the creation event and the Adam and Eve uh, story a lot of times in Sunday school and uh, um, you'll have done all the colouring thing a lot of time and you're almost probably fed up with it and it's understandable if I was in your place I'd be tired of it too and that's why I have tried to make this session a little more um, advanced not too advanced but a little uh, more than what you've already learned a little more than the obvious so y'all are aware of the six days of creation and y'all are basically aware of the plot of the whole story of what happens on the creation door and y'all are aware of what happens but now we will be looking at what that means and why it happens and uh, it will uh, not just be related to the bible but also several sources apart from the bible and uh, I want you to think critically about the things that I will be discussing and at the same time I also want you to have fun um, because I know that y'all are well aware of the creation story so I want y'all to enjoy a bit also while learning not just uh, throw theory at y'all or uh, throw this citation or this quote or this thing from the CCC or UCAT I don't want to just do that constantly so I want you to have fun with the materials that we are dealing with today and uh, secondly here are the uh, topics that we are going to be covering and uh, I'm not going to read out each one thing because uh, we will anyway be covering them uh, so on the right side you can see I think it's the right side for you guys I'm not entirely sure uh, yeah okay I, it should be the right side you will see uh, this bar where there are icons and words written next to it uh, there is a quotation mark and the word right written under it and then there's a light bulb written with the word understand and a question mark with the word think and uh, those are cues of what you are to do on which slide and uh, if I tell you to write those quotation marks will appear on the slide and I don't think there are many of those because I don't want you to be writing the entire time because often there is this thing known as passive note taking where you're just writing without actually paying attention to what's going on or understanding the material so I'm not going to make you write anything. You can write. There's no problem with that. I don't really have a problem with it. But I don't want you to get so engrossed in taking down notes that you don't really understand what's going on or think about it. And uh, that's exactly why you will see these two uh, icons appearing a lot more often. Uh, understand. That is, you have to understand what's going on and uh, understand the main concepts at least. And then there's a question mark which requires you to think about it. Think about what is uh, being discussed or what is the uh, point of it or why I said what I said or why this is the way it is and I, I leave it up to you to think critically. Um, 
so before we start i would uh, prefer starting with a quick introduction to god because um, here's the thing y'all are often taught about god and y'all are given very very vague definitions of god and i don't think it's fair that you are expected to believe something without uh, knowing exactly what it means so i will be giving a very concise definition of god and uh, before i do that i want to i if i if this was a physical class i would have asked what do you who do you think god is or what do you think uh, god is and uh, the responses that i would get normally since i can't really get a uh, interaction now would be something like uh, god is my father or god is my brother or god is a friend god is my protector god is there god is um let's see my savior these are the standard responses that i would get and uh, there's nothing wrong with them they're, those are good, pretty good answers they're, they're not wrong per se but when we try to define god that's not really how we go about because uh, when you're trying to define god uh, although in the catholic sense we do define god as being our father but we try not to uh, stick only to a relationship with god our relationship with god is an important part but that's not who only god is god is not only our father so your parents are your parents your father is your father but that's not his only identity similarly with god we try not to get only um, stuck to god being our father or god being our protector and therefore when we try to um uh, look at god we look at who god is and what he has done so who god is god is a being and not a person and i know that we often use the word uh, god uh the three person thing as uh, one and three person but that's a different meaning of the word person i'm not going to get into that that's a different meaning and uh, often when we refer to god we use the word being and why is it so well because the word being in itself refers to existing continuously i mean look at the break up the word to be that is uh, to exist and ing in the end that is continuing to exist or continuing a particular task and uh, playing for example you are playing right now so you are playing it's a continuous task that's going on right now so similarly we call god a being because he exists and he continues to do so and this will play out very well when you look out uh, look at uh, exodus next year when you will be going to 11th where uh, you will see god's name being revealed as i am and uh, you can connect the thoughts then or, and now of how uh, god reveals himself as i am someone who exists someone who is and uh, this brings us to a very important theme in uh, genesis it brings us to order and uh, structure this is a very very important theme in uh, the book of genesis or at least the very first chapter um i am not going to touch upon the rest of the chapters that they will come in the consequent classes but in the very first chapter it's a very very important theme uh, it's a core theme yes so as you can see it says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth now the earth is formless and empty and many translations use the word chaotic and void and even the word formless in itself refers to a chaotic state that is it does not have a form it does not have a structure and uh, you can see god then coming and uh, giving order to it and this is one very symbolic line of it the spirit of god was hovering over the waters the spirit of god that is an ordered state or ordered a uh, a state of order coming over the state of chaos and why do i refer to water as chaos uh, you can see later i think in matthew chapter 8 where uh, the herd of swine who are uh, the demon is put inside the herd of swine by jesus and uh, they demand for it you can read up on your own uh, i'm not going to go into that story they run into the water and I'm not going to explain the whole uh, relation of uh the demons running into the water and finding comfort there or uh, or finding a way to uh, escape or let themselves out and uh, of of demons and water I will not be focusing on that relation here but it is very fascinating I would recommend reading up on it so as we move along we see that the authors of genesis are trying to show god in a particular way and uh, you can see that the authors are using this poetic order or structure to depict god's order his precision and his planning and uh, i want you to see this uh, 
I have put it right next to it on the slide. Uh, you can see uh, the verses, how I have color coded them uh, to match the similarities. And you can see that all that is in yellow. You can see uh, it, it has this uh, declaration kind of phase where God says that let this come into existence or let the water under the sky be gathered to one place or let the land produce vegetation and you see God uh, declaring something and it is very uh, immediately it is immediately followed by uh, the happening or the occurrence of that particular uh, activity and that's why you see this one word uh, this uh, one phrase uh, uh, repeating itself as well and it was so so God declares something and it was so and in green you can see how uh, the creation is described so whatever was created whatever god declared was created and then uh, it is described and finally you can see in the pink highlight uh, and god saw that it was good so this is these are the four um, pieces or elements in that structure that uh, the authors of genesis wanted you to see uh, the declaration statement, the creation of that particular uh, event or day or uh, element or whatever it is and a description of what it is and finally an uh, uh, acknowledgement that it was good, an acknowledgement by God that it was good and uh, when they say that uh, God saw that it was good, it shows that God um, had planned it. He didn't just randomly create something and like oh this looks nice. Uh, no, he had randomly planned it and it went in accordance with his plan and that's why he says and it was good. And uh, this goes on for the first five days and uh, that that structure changes when uh, changes a bit when it comes to the sixth day. As you can see on the sixth day, the whole thing is a bit larger, the whole text. And uh, you can see the declaration stages there that God says that, okay, let us make mankind in our image and likeness. And... Uh, <coughs> Then you can see uh, God talking a bit more about how this creation will be. So this is similar to the description and uh, then you see that they are created and then you see a bit more uh, instruction actually uh, where God is telling them that you have to do this. That is you have to be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And uh, this is this is very symbolic because no other creation uh, element or event or anything was given their purpose explicitly by God. They were not told, okay, you are to do this. They were not told by God that this is what you have to do. But humans are the only ones who are told explicitly, verbally, that this is what you have to do. And uh, you can see God goes on to say that uh, I give you every seed bearing tree uh, plant on the face of the earth. And uh, he goes on for quite some time about uh, how they will rule over the earth. And uh, then again, we come back to the original structure and you see the pink highlight. God saw that it was good. As you can see, I have put uh, on the left side of the PPT, the Hebrew and the English translation, the English version, so that uh, you can compare and see how uh, there is quite some gap between uh, uh, the declarative uh, statement and uh, God saying it was good. And uh, I don't want to confuse you all with that. So uh, it's just for... Uh, you know, a little framework in your mind so you can understand that, uh, okay, both versions are align in uh, alignment and they are not uh, uh, completely different or lost in translation. And as we move on, it uh, we uh, will be covering the six days and its significance. And each day of creation reveals something about the human nature. And uh, this thing could either be something that God expects from us or God wants us to know or something about us and uh, the overarching theme of this is order uh, so as we go on to the very first day uh, we know that God created light on the first day and uh, when you read it you see that it's not just creation of light but creation of light and separation from darkness and this is a symbol of enlightenment and this is the very first act that God has done in the Bible and uh, it is the very first act of creation and it is an establishment of power and authority and uh, you will see in uh, the Bible later on 
this theme coming on and uh, Jesus as the light of the world uh, there's a song also uh, it's a very nice song and uh, this separation of light and darkness uh, earlier authors when they were writing this they found this to be very profound because if you think about it from uh, a more uh, practical point of view darkness was scary to them and the reason behind that was because uh, things were not the way they are now so uh, there was threat of wild animals there was a threat from uh, i don't know unknown environments and uh, therefore it was very very essential for light to be there with them some sort of fire or something so as you can see this this aspect of light when you look at it from an ancient point of view uh it was very helpful to them it helped them survive light became a sort of life it stopped you or saved you rather from dying and this is how the authors of uh, genesis construe god as this safety or comfort that protects us from the dangers that are out there and uh, that's it's the very first thing that they put uh that's the very first thing that you see god creating uh the next day that we go is uh, the water and the skies and uh, both of these uh, parts have quite some significance to it that is um water represents life and at the same time it represents chaos and um you will see uh, there are many uh, ancient philosophers who thought of uh, life originating or rather uh, everything being made out of water and today we know that's not true everything is not made of water and water was not the origin of all life uh there are it's it's a bit more complicated than just such a statement but water is essential for life and uh, even though i was mentioning that chaotic it is it can be chaotic at times uh it is also essential for life and uh, it requires a certain amount of balance for life to thrive and uh, the skies or uh, if you read the uh, hebrew word in the bible uh, they refer to the skies as the heavens because it's it's beyond us it's beyond what where we live and the place that we interact with and that's where god lives the beyond and uh, i was trying to uh, explain uh, this symbol of life and uh, the water which is actually the depth and the skies as the beyond uh, i have made some visuals so on the next slide you can see so uh, i will not explain each and everything from this slide uh, it's pretty self explanatory when i give you the slides you can read up on it but very simply put the above that is where the heavens are where god is we have our talents our gifts our interests our accomplishments our humility our good deeds and why do i say that's above because we are growing towards god we are uh, becoming god's people we are uh, growing closer to him and that's why it's symbolic of uh, growing upward and uh, you can see this this uh, plant i have put up as a, it's a very beautiful analogy of the plant growing towards the sun and similarly we are growing towards god and at the same time there's a depth to you there is your fear and uh, this is what i was talking about the chaotic side of uh, the waters and your fears your hatred your biases your selfish motives and i have put these as the rocks on near the roots so if you have these rocks you will not be able to grow you will not be your uh, plant or your uh, life will not have a very strong root so if you don't have a strong root you see the roots need to go out and look for water and uh, they spread out usually but if there are rocks it usually you know blocks it so the plant will die after some time when it can't find enough water in the soil and uh, it's something similar so if you don't have a strong base if you do not have a strong root you will not be able to grow towards god you will not be able to grow closer to god and for that these things that i have mentioned your fear your hatred your biases your selfish motives you need to know them you need to be aware of them you need to constantly uh, make an effort to um, i wouldn't say get rid of them but rather uh, try not to harm others with them because uh, 
we are humans we are flawed and we are going to have biases we are going to have fears we are going to have selfish motives we don't really have uh much control over the fact that we have these but we can choose how we act uh, you can uh, choose to hold back your biases you can choose to uh, not hate someone you can choose to not be selfish so even though the selfishness does arise you can choose not to be selfish and uh, that would help you grow closer towards god now when we come to the third day uh that is the creation of plants and land we see the commencement of organic life so this is the point where organic life is being introduced and this is symbolic of the seed of god's presence and uh, what does this mean well the seed of god is within us all of us and it wouldn't be fair if uh, only a certain few uh, had the opportunity of being Uh, of connecting to god or even go to heaven that is not a catholic doctrine it is a protestant doctrine i think it's called predestination where um uh, a certain people have already been selected and they will go to heaven and that is not what catholics believe in uh, we believe that everyone has the uh, chance and uh, um has the possibility of getting into heaven and that is determined by how they live and uh, how they freely decide their life would be and uh, God wanted to share his life with share his love with every human irrespective of whether they were exposed to Christianity or not and uh, we can't always expect people to uh, be exposed to Christianity and a you can look at people who are uh, living in isolated tribes and b you can look at the whole pre-christian era you can see uh, Abraham uh, Elijah Jeremiah these are prophets who were not introduced to christian doctrines because christianity didn't exist back then but they were introduced to god and in a similar way god does reveal himself to each one of us in different ways and uh, uh i have given this ccc quote that you can read for yourself uh that it's it's basically saying that all those uh, who are aware of the gospel and then refuse to believe it will not be going to heaven but say you were not you didn't have the chance to uh be introduced to uh, the gospels or the doctrines or uh you didn't get a chance to um know jesus then it doesn't seem fair to send it to send that person to hell even when they lived a good life and uh, i want you to see these parallels of uh, the seed of god's presence and god wanted all of us to know him and that's exactly why you see these recurring image images uh you can see uh, it's i think that's a sumerian uh, tree of life or something very similar and uh, then there is the yggdrasil which is uh, the norse depiction of uh, uh, the tree of wisdom i think uh, i think many people who like marvel movies uh, the way i do uh, you will see uh, in thor uh, i think the dark world he explains uh, the yggdrasil so just making it a bit more relatable and finally there is the tree of life and uh, we accept and believe the tree of life and uh, people who believed in the norse values or the sumerian values did not may not have got a chance to uh, believe in the christian uh, version of it and uh, may not have gotten a chance to believe in those things and it is not fair uh, to punish them god does not want you to perish this is the quote i have given down there god does not want anyone to perish he wants everyone to be saved and sometimes it's not possible for everyone uh, to be introduced to the christian doctrine or the catholic uh, teachings and uh, uh, the teachings of the church and to know jesus christ so uh, you see this these uh, images coming again and again in different narratives and uh, you see similar themes uh, coming across on how to live a good life and how uh, you can be a good person and uh, so even then even if you weren't introduced to say the gospels or something like that uh, you could be influenced by the spirit of god and uh, that's why you see such similar images and i will now be showing you a video and i found it very heart touching it's uh, actually a video of a little boy who lost his father and uh, his father did not believe in god and uh, 
he goes to pope francis uh, crying about it that uh, uh, does my father go to heaven and uh, i i want you to watch the video and look at pope francis is apply to that dai 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 Vieni, vieni, vieni da me, Emanuele. Vieni da me e dimmi dall'orecchio. Dimmi dall'orecchio. Vieni. Vieni. Io ho chiesto, ho chiesto permesso a Emanuele di dire in pubblico la domanda e lui mi ha detto di sì, per questo la dirò. Poco tempo fa è, mancato, viene a, a, è venuto a mancare mio papà. E lui era ateo, ma ci ha fatto battesare a tutti e quattro figli e era un uomo bravo e in cielo papà che bello che un figlio dica di suo papà era bravo bella testimonianza di quell'uomo ha dato ai suoi figli perché i suoi figli possa, potranno de, dire è un uomo bravo, era un uomo bravo. E bella testimonianza del figlio, del figlio che ha ereditato con la forza del papà, anche ha avuto il coraggio di piangere davanti a tutti noi. Se quell'uomo è stato capace di fare figli così, è vero, era un uomo bravo. È un uomo bravo. Chi dice chi va in cielo è Dio. Ma com'è il cuore di Dio davanti a un papà così? Com'è? Co 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 cosa vi, vi sembra a voi? Un cuore di papà. Dio ha un cuore di papà. E davanti a un papà, che non credente, è stato capace di battesare i figli e di darle quella bravura ai figli voi pensate che Dio sarebbe capace di lasciarlo lontano da te? pensate quello? ma forte, con coraggio Dio abbandona i suoi figli Dio abbandona i suoi figli quando sono bravi ecco Emanuele, questa è la risposta Dio sicuramente era fiero di tuo papà perché è più facile essendo credente battesare i figli che essendo non credente battesare e sicuramente a Dio questo è piaciuto tanto parla con tuo papà prega tuo papà grazie Emanuele per il tuo coraggio Okay, now we come to the fourth day of creation, that is the sun and the moon. And uh, the sun and the moon, uh, the creation of the sun and the moon, uh, teaches us about equality and mercy. And the way it does it is that the sun and the moon shines over you irrespective of whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are smart, whether you are not so smart, whether you are um, fair and attractive or whether... You are not, as per the societal expectations of uh, attractive, uh, 
the sun shine the same shines the same for everyone and so does the moon and this is very symbolic of how god is not an impartial god he is not here to choose only the fair the attractive um, the richest the um, smartest because uh, if you look into the bible those are the categories that are rejected <laughs> it's very funny uh, the richest are rejected he was sitting with the poor and the sinners the smartest that is the sanhedrin the uh, the high priest they are rejected because uh, uh, he did not want to be with them uh, he wanted to be with the, uh, he says that he has come for uh, the sinners and uh, the poor because uh, a doctor or a physician does not heal those who are well but rather those who need healing uh, and uh, it, it's quite a good message of uh, equality that god does not have this bias that only you will come that you know just the way i mentioned just sometime back that uh, god does not choose a select few but rather he is giving everyone the chance and uh, his mercy extends the same towards everyone irrespective of who it is um so irrespective of your past irrespective of uh, how you look how you are um whether you are rich or not god still gives everyone the same chance and god loves everyone the same this reminds us of heaven in heaven there is no distinction we are all equal in the eyes of god and um the creation of the sun and the moon and how it uh, what what message it gives is supposed to remind us of heaven all creation is supposed to remind us of heaven because uh, honestly there isn't there wasn't much difference between heaven and earth uh, initially um, they were both meant to be beautiful creations it was the fall of man that uh, changed the latter into something completely different but they were both supposed to be a space where we are all one in the eyes of god and you can see these verses that i have mentioned for god shows no uh, partiality or there is no jew or greek we are all the same in the eyes of christ and uh, this is a very beautiful message that we get that we have we may have had a past we may have uh, certain qualities that we may not be proud of but god accepts us and as long as we're willing to repent and walk towards christ and if i take you back to that slide of growing towards christ even though we have our biases our depth and we choose to work through a through it through it and uh, truly repent he will accept us lastly we come to day 5 that is the birds and the fishes and day 6 that is land animals and humans and i have clubbed these two uh, days together because they have a common theme of compassion the thing is that we aren't the only ones living on earth and uh, i've heard many uh, priests say this during their sermons that uh, we need to extend our uh, charity and love towards our brothers and sisters that is animals uh, and fishes and birds and it might be an odd phrase of referring to animals and birds as our brothers and sisters but it's not that odd it's uh, quite uh, a correct thing it's 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 not uh, wrong per se because uh, a when we look at it earth is our home and thereby people who are living in it are our family members and uh, we're all brothers and sisters in creation that is we were all created by god and it is imperative it is our duty that we take care of each other and uh, don't act in a selfish way that and hog up all the space for ourselves and uh, um treat like the home the house the home only belongs to us uh, and uh, this extends not just to animals but as other humans as well uh so it is a sin of high degree of what we have done to earth through global warming pollution deforestation etc etc we have insulted god the artist and his creation the art that is and i think there was a encyclical by the pope uh, on this concerning uh issues about the environment and how we as catholics need to stand up against um uh, all the um cruelties that uh the environment has to face because of us and uh, i can't recall the name of the encyclical if i uh, recall it i will put it in the uh, description or the references that i have uh, but even the pope wants us to know that 
as catholic as uh, catholics and christians we uh, ought to take care of the creation of god uh, all the other creations be it other humans plants animals uh, the ocean and uh, i have been uh, seeing that many schools that you guys are in do participate in uh, uh, beach drives on cleaning the beaches and all that stuff and that's that's pretty good um, i know due to the covid situation you all can't but that's pretty good and uh, that also counts as a catholic duty it is not just an environmental duty it's a catholic duty to keep our home clean uh, to keep our planet clean because it's a creation of god and uh, and all the cruelties that it has to face because of us is in a sense something that implies that we are mocking god and his creation so uh, that's something that we need to take care about uh, now when we <clears throat> come to the seven day uh, there's we know that on the seven day god rested and uh, this is one of common statement that i often hear if god is all powerful why did he have to rest and uh, a very simple reply would be that over here rest does not mean sleeping or relaxing but rather stopping a particular activity on the left side you can see that i have put this purple color bar in which you can you see the word rest being used in those particular uh, instances and uh, it implies a rest from war and it does not mean that god is like okay fine the war is going on but i will give you all rest so go and sleep that's not what it means it means the war was stopped and those are particular instances i think there are six or five or six instances where the, the word rest is mentioned and it refers to uh, the stopping of a particular activity and then you even see in Matthew 11 where God uh, Jesus says that all those who are weary uh, I will give you rest Jesus is not going to give you a good night sleep or like you know a spa treatment or something like that that's not the intent but rather he is telling you that the, it will be the stopping of the uh, particular feeling that you have that is uh, feeling weary or uh, that you are feeling uh, that you are in pain or the suffering that you have been experiencing it is uh stopping you from those particular activities that have been going on so that's what rest means here so this that's what it means when it says that god rested he stopped creating and not that he went and took a nap uh now when we look at uh since we have seen the six days of creation we can compare it with the uh two accounts of creation if you've seen it uh you can just flip the page of genesis 1 you'll see that uh, there are two accounts of creation and why is it so well firstly it was an it uh was mainly dependent on oral uh passage of the particular stories and they did not have things to write it down on so as i have written lack of ipads they didn't really have ipads back then to click take notes or something on google docs or something uh i think invention of writing on stone was a bit later i think or uh yeah, papyruses i think that's what it's called and uh paper and sheets they came a bit later and uh, so most of the time these stories were passed down from one generation to another through uh were passed down orally and uh, if i recall correctly it was done mostly on the passover night uh, if i recall this correctly i'm not entirely sure uh, you'll be learn this next year when you'll will be learning exodus and the passover and uh, uh, the aftermath of the passover and uh, there are different authors uh, we give them this uh, abbreviation jepd uh i'll i'll tell you about the jpd on the next slide uh so these different authors portray the different aspects of god or rather the different views of god and uh, one key example is see uh, look at the first creation and the second creation in the first creation god as seen as an authority figure who has complete authority over everything and only his word can create everything and you can see you can see creation the creation story in the start where it says that uh, uh and god said let there be this and there was let there be light and there was light and you can see this authority being drawn this uh this is a more uh, i think it's a yahweh tradition uh yes i think so it's the yahweh tradition no it's the elohist tradition my bad the first uh uh account of creation is the elohist tradition where uh they view god as this all powerful and almighty god who only has to say the word and it will be so and uh, that's how they view god and i'm not going to read each and every uh, distinction between the creation story the two cre- uh, accounts uh, but uh, you can read it by yourself but i, I want to emphasize this one point especially on the, how they viewed god so the first account that is the elohist the e in the jepd 
viewed God as someone who was an authority figure and could only speak and it would be uh, it would materialize and uh, you can even see this in John uh, 1 1 I think and uh, uh, word was with God and word was God and they are trying to show the power of God's speech and uh, whereas the second account of creation uh, they are the Yahweh I think yeah Yahweh Elohim uh, they refer to God as Yahweh Elohim that's why they are called as Yahwists uh, they see God as someone who is actively taking part in this creation process and you can see him coming down and shaping Adam out of dust and uh, out of this uh, and he takes uh, Eve from the rib and he is actively coming and like a, you know you have this image of God as being the potter so he is actively coming and making it so one we have God as an ultimate authority and here we have an, a different side of God as coming down to where we are and actively taking part in our lives. So these two accounts both are very important. That's exactly why both were added in the very first chapter of Genesis. They could have just picked one whichever they wanted and put it. But the reason they put both these accounts is because they want you to see both these sides of God. And uh, now you can see this uh, the JEPD. The Yahwists were the ones who called uh, originally uh, the uh, many people thought that Moses wrote uh, Genesis and uh, the Pentateuch that is the first five books of the Bible were attributed to Moses but uh, recent uh, advances in theology and uh, uh, scripture reading shows that there are at least four different authors uh, the Yahwists who refer to God as Yahweh Elohim and uh, the uh, Elohists who refer to God as Elohim and uh, you can see that you can see the time period is different you know, in which they are writing and uh, the Deuteronomists and the priestly class is not actually important right now but uh, you can still know it that the Deuteronomists uh, were mostly uh, concerned with writing the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus or the priestly sorry the priestly class are mostly uh, involved in the text of Leviticus and uh, the Leviticus uh, the book of Leviticus is associated with uh, uh, stuff related to priests and uh, their lives and uh, so those are the very uh, simple way of distinguishing the four authors and uh, even though there are different authors of Genesis and the Bible as a whole uh, you can see this verse that I have put that even though it had its uh, origin or rather materialization in human will it was actually inspired by God and that's I think during the question answer round we were exp uh, explaining the origin of the Bible and that's when we said that even though uh, humans were the one writing it they were influenced by God and uh, as we move on, uh, I wanted to emphasize one particular point of angels. And uh, this is one point that I hear quite often uh, from my students, from friends and uh, from my classmates when I was a Confu student. That where are the angels? Where are the angels in the uh, creation story? And uh, I know that some of you might be baffled by this and be curious about angels at the same time. So I thought I'd take up this part on angels. So, the argument is something like this. All things mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis or the creation account exist. Correct? So, angels are not mentioned in the first part of Genesis. So, angels don't exist. This is the argument that currently holds, uh, that people make against the existence of angels. But let's look at this argument a bit more. So, there is a short answer to this and there is a slightly longer answer. It's not that long, it's just a little longer. So one is given by St. Augustine and uh, later picked up by St. Thomas Aquinas. So I will not read this whole thing, you can read it by yourself. But uh, St. Uh, Augustine is very simply saying that angels are not, uh, are very uh, poorly understood because angels are not beings. They are not something that uh, exists per se because angels are spirits and angels as a word in itself actually refers to messenger so when a spirit becomes a messenger they become angels so say you are a human and you become a doctor only then can I call you a doctor <clears throat> before that I cannot call you a doctor before that you're just a human similarly angels when they become messengers and when they are given a particular task they become angels otherwise they're only spirits in heaven with God and uh, this is the main distinction he makes that angels are not just spirits but rather it's a job title 
they are actually just spirits who are given this job title of, of being an angel like you can see angel gabriel angel gabriel was given the task of going and talking to mary and angels in the bible throughout the bible are given some task to do and that's how we see them uh you can read this explanation it's very uh, well written it's actually from the ccc uh and he goes on saint augustine to say that once that we have understood that angels are um that is a job description we can then understand what uh the spirit is and where it was during creation why isn't it mentioned so he says that very simply we can understand the creation of spirits in the very third verse of the first chapter that is separation of light from darkness so he says that when god says let there be light it does refer to the creation of light but at the same time it also refers to the creation of spirits who are often considered as light and uh, it, it's it has this very similar uh, or parallel theme with it and uh, you can see this this coming back to the part on enlightenment where uh, angels were given this task of giving messages so in a certain way they are enlightening the person who they are going to mary was told that she will be uh carrying jesus in her womb so she was en- uh, angel gabriel was enlightening mary so you can see this this very uh, beautiful uh, theme running across it and uh, when god says when when the bible says that uh, uh, light was separated from the darkness saint uh, augustine considers that as the period when the spirits or the angels were separated from the fallen angels or satan and his army or league of fallen angels so it's it's a very beautiful uh, way of looking at it and uh, then a slightly longer answer is uh, that all things mentioned in uh the first chapter of genesis exist tigers were not mentioned in the first chapter of genesis so tigers don't really exist so you see a problem with this kind of reasoning if i say that all things that were mentioned in the first uh, chapter of genesis exist and tigers were not really mentioned in the first chapter then i can very safely say that tigers don't exist but where from the very property of observation we can say that's not exactly right tigers do exist so clearly there's something wrong with this type of reasoning that uh, angels don't exist because they're not mentioned in the first chapter so let's this modify this a bit we can instead of saying that all things don't exist all things mentioned don't exist we can say that all categories mentioned exist so angels fall under a metaphysical character uh, category uh, i will be explaining it with a table with an, on the next slide but very simply put metaphysics or metaphysical beings are beyond this world physics is a, is our world physics is a study of nature metaphysics is a study of beyond our nature that is a supernatural physics natural metaphysics supernatural so angels would be supernatural because they are beyond our natural world so they would fall under that metaphysical character category so angels exist and i want to look on the right side that is and that is a biblically accurate depiction of an angel uh yeah i know it's pretty scary but it 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 has a certain amount of beauty as well and uh, that's exactly why when you see angels always introduce themselves they always like do not be afraid now you understand it because if you saw an angel baby with the wings you're not going to be afraid if you see something like that you might be afraid <laughs> so if you look at this table you will see that there's a physical category so let's let's look at the physical category category in the first chapter of genesis the f- first we can look at is land animal the sixth day mentions land animals so if the category of land animals has tigers lions dogs blah 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 whatever cats and the whole list of animals sea animals or as we see fishes and birds and all that creating on the fifth day you can see carp goldfish sharks uh, catfish uh i can't really re- name more fishes nothing coming to my mind right now but you get the idea under that category all those come similarly when we look at the metaphysical category that is the supernatural category we can see light and heavens being mentioned before as i talked about it before light and heavens being mentioned in the very first words and these refer to angels and spirits angels as i said before are not just spirits they are spirits with a task they are given the job of going and giving someone the message and uh, you can see darkness over here that is separated light and darkness refers to the fallen angels and uh, i thought i would explain this uh, 
so it's a bit more clear so that when you uh, discuss this or if someone approaches you on this topic you have the sufficient yeah sufficient knowledge on how to tackle this or at least you have a uh, foundation on how to uh, understand it so i i thought it was i generally uh, thought it was important to discuss this so now we will be doing a painting analysis uh, we have been covering a lot of uh, uh, theories and uh, quotes from St. Augustine, the CCC and all. So it might get a little heavy. So relax a bit. There's nothing you have to write away. There's nothing you have to uh, try and understand per se. It's a little uh, fun thing that you can do for yourself. And uh, since this these videos are pre-recorded, they're not exactly live. So you can pause the video. There's no harm in that. Pause the video, look at the image and try to make sense of it. See what you can see. See what you can uh, understand. Uh, this is an activity we used to do in IO as well. Uh, I remember father showing us uh, the picture of the prodigal son by uh, painted by Rembrandt, and uh, it was it was a pretty it was a pretty good picture, and uh, I thought I'd do something similar. Painting analysis is a very uh, it's a very interactive way of learning. You actively try to look for something. So you want you can pause right now and uh, look at the image, and try to deduce something by yourself. Try to reason by yourself, and. Uh, I will be starting with my view of this. Uh, if this was a physical class, I would have asked for you your opinions, but I can't really do that. Uh, so there is this dome that appears, and often when you look at this image at just a flow, first glance, it would look as though this man is looking at the night time. That he is crossing daytime and he's crossing night. He's looking at night time, and uh, that would be a good explanation uh, if you're just starting out. But if you look at the dome, the stars end at the dome and the moon is inside the dome. So the night and day are both inside that particular dome of sky. And this man is not looking beyond the night time, but rather he's looking at beyond our world. He's looking into the heavens and the realm of the spirits. This is my interpretation. Okay. Uh, let me, let me just quickly tell you that, uh, this image, we have no idea about its origins. This exact image, we have no idea about its origins. It's called as the Flammarion engraving, I think. I'm not entirely sure if I got the spelling right, uh, the pronunciation right. But we have no idea about its origins or anything like that. We are quite clueless. So this is my interpretation of it. So by all means, do not take it as the truth. I just like to do it as fun, look at paintings and try to get my get some meaning out of it. Try to understand what the painter is trying to say. And uh, one interesting fact that I think about this is that the person you can see in this image, this this human who is uh, passing through the human and the spiritual world or the angelic world and the human world is that you can see in the background, you can see human civilization and you can see a really huge tree, which for some reason just reminded me of uh, the uh, forbidden tree. And uh, there are many other uh, significant uh, uh, symbols of trees in the Bible. And uh, it just reminded me of, you know, how this person has left uh, civilization and how left his family behind, has left probably his land and money and everything behind to look for God. And uh, it's something that runs parallel with uh, what Jesus says as well. And uh, I just find this very fascinating. But I think this is something that I find very, very, very fascinating about this picture. I want you to look at this on the other slide. Yeah, there it is. So on, on the uh, left on the right side, actually, my bad. On the right side, uh, top part, you will uh, you will see these three spheres, spheres, and they reminded me of something I re I read in the Bible, and I could not uh, stop myself from making that distinct this uh, uh, of looking for that pattern of of seeing how similar they were, and it is that uh, it is the vision that Ezekiel has and if you look at the I have marked it you can see that one uh, circle that I have marked with I'm not even sure how to describe it but there is a wheel inside a wheel and there's a very similar description of uh, uh, Ezekiel uh, Ezekiel's vision that's a painting of Ezekiel's vision on the right bottom and that is very similar to what is being painted above and that as I showed you before the image of the angel the one that I said looked quite uh, scary. That's the exact same image over here. That's a different depiction of it. And it is a spirit. And I have marked two more circles and it it looks like a trinity. Similar, very similar to Ezekiel's uh, vision 
where uh, there is a god the father above on his throne b there uh, there is a, a being that has four faces of a lion and ox a man and an eagle which is later symbolized which is later uh, attributed to the evangelists and uh, that is done in accordance to jesus that is they are trying to describe jesus jesus as the eagle who can see from above and soaring from above jesus as the man uh, jesus as an ox jesus as uh, uh, there was one more i can't remember okay i lost my track as the lion yes and uh, finally there is the spirit or the angel or the i think spirit is a better word over there uh, as uh, the wheel within a wheel and i find it very uh, symbolic and very very fascinating that a wheel within a wheel and there are many ways of looking at a wheel but a wheel within a wheel would most probably not work in that manner at least it might not work so what it's trying to say is that ezekiel saw the two wheels spinning and if we were try to attempt such an uh, uh, an engineering feat we might not be able to do that and it's very symbolic that the world that is there beyond us the spiritual world where god lives it is not comprehensible by our minds and it works in different ways and often we try to uh, challenge god that why would you do something like that why would you do that uh, or we try to bargain with god that hey if you do this i will stop this and we try to drag god down to our logic and our reasoning and uh, we fail to understand that god is in a realm or in a place where we cannot understand him and yet he chooses to come down to live with us and understand our life so it's a pretty symbolic thing you can read through the exact verses i have put the exact verses from ezekiel over here on the left you can see you can read the exact verses you can look at the uh, painting on the right of uh, ezekiel's vision and you can look at the painting uh, take the liberty of going back at different places and trying to connect the dots like like a big puzzle if people like solving puzzles i like solving puzzles so it's a fun thing and uh, yeah you can look take a minute and laugh at this one uh, imago dei uh, adam as a youtuber uh, it's quite funny it took me quite some time to make this i i want you to specifically note the adam has zero subscribers uh that is the anomaly for the only people on earth and uh, uh, even eve does not subscribe to his channel <laughs> it's quite funny as we move along we come to this concept known as imago dei or uh, in english it's called image of god and you must have heard this again and again uh, you are made in the image and likeness of god but what does this really mean well very simply put that you have a uh, free will and you have the ability to create you have intelligence and you can reason and you have authority these are all things that are attributed to god and i know it's quite scandalous to call ourselves gods but when we call ourselves gods we call ourselves gods a small g not the big g and the big g is only for god and only reserved for god no and that's exactly why the uh, commandment says that thou shall not put any other gods before me or equal to me and we are not before god or equal to god in any possible way we are uh, much much below him and uh, the reason we are co- call ourselves god is because of this verse uh, you are gods sons of the most high all of you and it makes sense to some extent well if your parents are humans you will be human as well you will not be a butterfly so if our father is god then we are gods as well in a certain sense the smaller g where we have the right where we have the ability to create we are given the right by god himself to rule over the earth as it, we can go back to genesis uh, the first chapter itself where uh, uh, during the sixth day god tells them that you are you have the authority to rule over the uh, fish in the sea and the birds of the sky uh, and uh, this is what it means to be made in the divine image of being free of having a uh, free choice and to be able to create and uh, i have on this slide uh that we are able to be free and make our choices by ourselves something that only god can do uh god is free we don't see animals have a free will per se they are driven by their instincts they are driven by uh their need for survival so 
if an animal um, kills another animal we would not consider that as murder because they're not freely doing so they need that to survive they need it because they're not uh, driven by a free choice they are driven by uh, instincts and i will agree that sometimes we are driven as by instincts as well we are we let ourselves drive uh, we let our instincts drive ourselves and uh, that is problematic because we have the ability to stop ourselves we have the ability to be to make our decisions and to be free and uh, therefore if i kill someone that counts as murder but if an animal kills another animal that will not count as murder because the difference between me and an animal is that a i can reason and b i am free to choose so this is what it means to be uh, a small g god that we are free and we have authority over things and uh, uh, it goes back to when i was talking with the environment that we are doing a terrible job we have been given authority of the planet and we are acting like uh, terrible terrible rulers and uh, uh, you know the bad kings uh, that are mentioned in the bible were kind of similar to that and uh, there's a nice video that i have explaining this and uh, you should watch it it's on uh, god as being the principle of sovereignty and uh, uh, authority and we as being only pieces or other small bits with small pieces of authority whereas uh, god is the source of all authority and intelligence and free will and uh, we have only bits and pieces of that uh, he has and that too we have it only because of him so i'm going to let you watch that video now one of the debates we might say between early christianity and the late roman empire was whether or not an emperor could be god literally right to be deified to put in a to be put in a temple and you can see why that might happen because that's someone at the pinnacle of a very steep hierarchy who has a tremendous amount of power and influence but the christian response to that was never confuse the specific sovereign with the principle of sovereignty itself it's brilliant it's, you see how difficult it is to come up with an idea like that so that even the person who has the power is actually subordinate to something else subordinate to uh, let's call it a divine principle for lack of a better word so that even the king himself is subordinate to the principle and we still believe that because we believe that our president our prime minister is subordinate to the damn law whatever the body of law right there's a principle inside that that even the leader is subordinate to and without that you could argue you can't even have a civilized society because you're your leader immediately turns into something that's transcendent and all powerful and i mean that's certainly what happened in the soviet union and what happened in maoist china and what happened in nazi germany because there was nothing for the powerful to subordinate themselves to okay so this is the last section that we will be covering i have a feeling i may have crossed my time limit but uh, often when people are uh, told about the creation story they have trouble believing in it and uh, because of advances in the scientific uh, community and the scientific methods uh, there is um, difficulty in believing in uh, uh, the creation story especially with things like the big bang and uh, uh, the evolutionary uh, theories and uh, even i am a psychology student i am uh, trained to uh, pursue the scientific method and uh, study the human mind in an objective manner so how can say a person who studies science a person who is inspired by the scientific methods or someone who uh, is driven towards an objective way of thinking accept all of these well uh, what the church says is and this is not from the bible or the ccc this is from the international theological commission that was a long article that i had to read uh, so i have summarized those bits and pieces so you don't have to read through that entire long article and uh, it basically says that uh, we can very easily reject creatio ex nihilo which simply means that a universe from nothing a universe could not have existed out of nothing and this is something that both scientists and uh, um, theologians or theists or religious people have some agreement upon that uh, the universe just could not have randomly popped up and uh, you can see this line the supp- the supposition of an absolute beginning is not scientifically inadmissible so the church is saying that a universe that has a start does not seem uh, like a wrong idea for the scientific method to pursue so they are completely right in doing so so by the very virtue of that the big bang does not contradict the creation doctrine in any way or at least in this particular way where they are trying to understand that the universe did not just randomly pop up so uh, 
if we are trying to reconcile the scientific method and uh, um, say the cre the creation story, we can thus uh, put forth that even though there are quite some ev uh, evidences or uh, pieces of information that point towards the Big Bang, there needs to be a start or other something that caused the Big Bang. And although actually the Big Bang is not even uh, supported anymore, it's not uh, considered as a good theory anymore. There is something known as the Big Bounce, but I will not go into that. Uh, even then, if we have to uh, agree at some point that there has to be a start. There has to be a point from where it all begins. And uh, this is where many creationists, sorry, where many people who believe in the creation story and uh, uh, or rather who believe in the Bible or believe in uh, Catholicism uh, come in agreement with the scientific method that uh, there needs to be a particular start. And uh, people who believe in Catholicism often attribute that to God. Uh, during the Q&A session, we covered this up. We uh, saw Aquinas talking about the first mover and uh, the very uh, first being that started all other chains of cause and effect. And uh, you can see something very similar being drawn on in this article. They even mention Aquinas quite a lot. And uh, that's about the creation of uh, the universe and the Big Bang and all that stuff. But what about the evolution, uh, evolutionary theories? Well, uh, these are the sources that I have mentioned for you to read on the slide, but uh, I will not be reading them out one by one. But very simply put, the Catholic Church does not um, disregard or say that uh, it's wrong or, you know, uh, it's just a theory. Because I think Pope John Paul II, I think, I, I can't remember properly, but one of, the, one of the popes, I think it's John Paul II, said that it is... Uh, remarkable how far we've come with science and it is difficult to say that uh, the evolutionary theory is only a hypothesis because it, there are a lot of evidences proving that it is more than one uh, more than just a hypothesis and it does have a lot of evidence for it and uh, this is coming from the Pope and uh, how do we reconcile uh, evolutionary theories with our religious faith well uh, what religious uh, People who believe in uh, the evolutionary theory, like myself, uh, we are called, uh, I think, I forgot what it's called, uh, theistic evolution, I think, that's what it's called. I can't really remember the exact word for it at the moment. Uh, I think it's called theistic evolution. Uh, it's very simply put that evolution does have quite some support for it and uh, the church does uh, tend to agree that, okay, the evidence is... Uh, fairly remarkable as Pope John Paul II, I think it was John Paul II who said that and uh, it's it's blind faith if we disregard it or just say it's wrong it's not very religious to do that it's not in the it's not very logical to do that so uh, the logical part that comes in is that even though evolution could be true uh, as it has proven through all its evidence it did not randomly occur, as many uh, Darwinians and Neo-Darwinians suggest that uh, uh, it was random genetic fluctuations that causes, uh, say, this animal to survive more uh, than the other or make this, more like, uh, make this particular animal more likely to survive than the other. So the Catholic Church says that even though we could accept evolution, we have to agree that there was a divine element to it, that is, God was actively guiding the evolution process. And uh, you can read this paragraph and uh, there's another paragraph. Uh, you can read this entire thing, but very simply put, they are again using the first mover or the first agent argument that it was God who put these things in motion and uh, carefully crafted it to uh, work out the way it has to where you and I exist. We are incredible beings who can think very well, who have created such amazing devices. And uh, you can read up on your own this, this entire paragraph that I have put up on uh, how God is the, uh, even if evolution, if evolutionary uh, theories are true, then it is the work of God and uh, he is the reason behind it. And uh, I think that is the end of this lecture. So thanks for not falling asleep. Don't worry, the lecture, uh, the worksheet is not very difficult. It's a very small one. It has only five questions. It's not like endless. Uh, it is not a objective kind of uh, worksheet it does not have fill in the blanks or something one word or something the reason i have made it short is because i need you to think critically i want 
to see whether you have understood the concepts or understood what I have taught. So if you are able to explain what I have taught and substantiate it, substantiate your claim and uh, show that you have understood what is being taught has been taught today, I will understand that you understood it. And that's all that I want uh, to know that you have understood because making you do one word fill in the blanks and all is not very productive in my opinion it, is, it does not accomplish much but if I know that you have understood it well that's enough for me so with that I have finished the lecture thank you for watching now I have got to edit this video 2000 years later